Hi, everybody. How are you? Thank you for coming out in rainy Los Angeles tonight. And welcome to everybody else who's watching us at the live stream. I'm Beth Millman. I'm the National Director of Television Contracts. We are so happy that you chose to spend your Tuesday evening with us. Um, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves. And then we're going to begin our PowerPoint for you. Olga Rodriguez, I'm the National Director of Theatrical Contracts. Dan Bowser, Senior Manager of Television Contracts. I'm Lon Huber, a Senior Business Rep and Auditor for Theatrical Contracts. Okay. Okay. All right, so what we thought we would do tonight is give you an overview of the TV and theatrical agreement. How many of you knew that we went into negotiations earlier, right before the summer, to renegotiate TV and theatrical. OK, so I'd say about good more than half of you. So we went in earlier in the summer to renegotiate TV and theatrical. <laughs> so uh, in tonight's presentation, what we want to do is take you through the high points of the changes we made to the agreement. What we did is we sort of bullet pointed the most, uh, what we thought the most interesting and obvious points that you need to know. And then what we figured we'd do, because we don't want to hear ourselves talk all night, though personally I could hear myself talk all night, um, we want to really make this interactive and take questions from all of you. So um, without further ado, we're going to get started. So welcome to the 2014 SAG after TV theatrical agreement. And also I should say, we focused on initial compensation if you're looking for detailed residual information, detailed information on uh, background, a lot of that might be covered in a different presentation, but in order to sort of make this more Q&A for you guys, we chose to just really focus more on the initial comp. And we believe later, in 2015, our residuals department is going to come in and put together something pretty fabulous for you guys. OK. Here we go. Um, so the Screen Actors, Actors Guild codified basic agreement, the Screen Actors Guild television agreement, the Exhibit A to the AFTRA National Code, the CW Supplement, and the Screen Actors Guild basic cable live action agreement. Uh, the network code agreement was not included in that negotiation. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, the, uh, the television agreement and the uh, SAG codified basic agreement all expired on June 30th, 2014. Um, after, well actually prior to its expiration, there was a long uh, period of what's called the W&W &W process and essentially that's called wa uh, wages and working conditions. Um, that's where uh, certain groups of performers come in and voice whatever concerns they might have about the existing contracts. And um, that's actually a fairly long uh, number of weeks as well. Um, after that's concluded, then uh, proposals were put together. Negotiations actually were scheduled to start May 5th, 2014. The negotiating committee was uh, led by uh, the president, Ken Howard. And our chief negotiator was David White. Um, we were able actually to reach a tentative agreement on the 4th of July, which was actually pretty exciting. Some of us were very concerned that we weren't going to be able to spend 4th of July <laughs> celebrating. <laughs> so it was our own Independence Day on 4th of July. It was <laughs> nine weeks, so it was, it was very exciting. So the term of the new agreement is supposed to last uh, from July the 1st, 2014, through June 30th, 2017. And uh, actually, the basic agreement, the name itself changed to SAG-AFTRA Codified Basic Agreement. Um, we achieved a, like a wage increase for the first year of 2.5%, for the second year, 3%, and for the third year, another 3%. Uh, we achieved uh, an increase for stand-ins under Schedule X1 and X2 of 5%. 5% each year for background actors under the CW supplement. Uh, the network primetime rerun ceilings were raised, were raised each 2% each for each year. Um, we also were able to achieve some uh, uh, increases in, in certain allowances. Let's see, we got an increase of 0.5% to the pension plan. 
Also an increase of 0.5% uh, under side letter K. There was no increase on uh, DVD residuals. Um, and the parties, we were able to come to an agreement concerning a process uh, to amend the collective bargaining agreement in the future. We're, in, we're able to decide on how to facilitate the merger of the health plans. As you all know, that has not happened yet. All right. So one of the things that we were able to achieve is uh, going forward a single television agreement. So all new programs and series are going to be produced under the 2014 SAG After Television Agreement, which will combine SAG TV and After Exhibit A. So existing SAG rates were increased by 2.5, 3, and 3. And all existing Exhibit A programs slash series shows like, say, for example, The Good Wife, including any of the CW shows, will continue under Exhibit A until they're canceled and go off the air. So existing after rates, which were at a higher rate, also increased by 2.5, 3, and 3. And there are some conditions where um, they can switch, a certain show can switch to the 2014 SAG After TV agreement if only the pilot or presentation was produced under Exhibit A but those were under some very specific conditions. So later, if you guys have questions about that, we can talk about that a little bit. Okay. Industry-wide basic cable agreement. So similar to the one television agreement, the 2014 SAG After TV agreement now includes SAG basic cable, includes a SAG basic cable agreement. So I don't know if you guys know, but Previous to this negotiation, Basic Cable was actually a separate agreement. So one of our guests is actually shaking her head. And um, now Basic Cable is actually included in the TV agreement, which is something, yes, that we had been fighting for for a long time. So um, that was something that was achieved in this agreement. So existing SAG Basic Cable shows and new shows of the same type now covered under the 2014 SAG After TV agreement. And similar to our earlier discussion, these SAG rates also increased by 2.5, 3, and 3. And also, like we were talking about for shows like The Good Wife, but shows that were Exhibit A basic cable shows, they also um, will continue under those deals at the higher after rates, and they will go up 2.5, 3, and 3. OK, so as you mentioned, or you know, made a little expression about the fact that uh, the, oh no, no, listen. We're uh, blameless up here. Be, it would, <laughs> we're innocent. We were very innocent. Um, uh, we sing Christmas songs. It's, so think, it's you know. obviously, you know, a big, a big issue for everybody. But, you know, because of this kind of big uh, problem that everyone viewed, uh, there was an arrangement sort of agreed to between the parties concerning um, ensuring that contributions were properly um, diverted into the plants in, a, in sort of in a, uh, I think a percentage was come up, they, the parties came up with, I don't remember, because I'm bad with numbers. Uh, what that's the why she went to law school. But, but the, <laughs> that's how, how it broke down. But there's, there's some concern, you know, there's a lot of issues for why the plants haven't merged. But uh, in order to try to protect the integrity of the plants, you know, because they, the contributions are what funds them, we agreed uh, with the employers that on, for instance, uh, for SAG p &H, like one hour network, half hour basic cable, syndication, new media, pay TV and home video contributions would be diverted to the plans, to, to the, the SAG, SAG plans. Uh, the, uh, after H&R plans would, would get contributions from half hour network, one hour basic cable, long form television, and CW. Uh, there are certain exceptions that apply to that arrangement, but I'm not going to go into them now because I don't remember them. But also, uh, I don't want to bore you guys half to death. Uh, the parties also agreed to uh, meet, uh, I guess, you know, at least twice a year to try to discuss how the arrangement's going because they we did take a look to see. Um, sort of what amount of contributions would come out of those specific types of works to ensure that the integrity of the plans were protected. Okay. okay, so how many in this room have worked um, under new media? 
Okay, so a fair amount. I would say maybe like a third of you. So one of the other things that this agreement achieved is we were able to achieve specific terms for what we are referring to as high budget SVOD terms. And SVOD is a sort of fancy way of saying subscription VOD. So that would refer to your Netflix, your Amazon, the Prime, your uh, Hulu Plus. Um, basically, effective October 1st of this year, a couple months ago, 2014, we were able to negotiate new television type terms that will replace free bargaining for what we're terming high budget programming made for Netflix type platforms. So again, the Amazons, the Hulu Plus. And just for clarity, this was a very similar, um, what would we say, paradigm that the Directors Guild and the Writers Guild negotiated because they came in before us so we did something similar, but obviously had to tweak it to fit the needs of our membership. Um, so in case you're wondering why certain things are the way they are, we were sort of following what's referred to in negotiations as part of a pattern. But we're a pattern where in a certain case, we were able to beat the pattern in a certain area. So for clarity, let's just say we'll look at a Netflix first. How many of you guys subscribe to Netflix? Okay, I would say almost all of you. And I just see my sister-in-law sitting here in the room, I just noticed. Hello, sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, tier one is 15 million plus subscribers. That would be an example of a Netflix, okay? Tier two is um, 15 million plus subscribers also, but with a lower budget than tier one, okay? And tier three, are gonna be a platform with fewer than 15 million <clears throat> subscribers. And when that would be, that'd be an example of a Hulu Plus who, don't quote me because when this goes live, so I might get yelled at by the Hulu people. If I remember during the summer, Olga, were they at like five or six million then? I don't know what their numbers were, but they are right now, they are less than 15 million, but they're growing. So what we did, and this again, we're based on, um, similar negotiations the other guilds had is we broke down the categories into different um, lengths and budgets. So if you look at the first tranche, you'll see a half hour from 20 to 35 minutes. Tier one, any budget that's greater or equal to two million. Tier two is any budget greater or equal to 1.3 million. And you can kind of go down the line for one hour, 90 minute, 120 minute, and that's sort of what we did as far as new media. For, for the needs of this room and for just sort of simplicity, because I could talk to you an hour and a half about new media, what we, what we did is when we now sign up shows in new media, we ask the producers, what is the length of your program, who are you producing it for, and what is your budget? And so if they're producing for different platforms like Netflix, Hulu, or um, Amazon. And they are gonna fit above or equal to one of these budget levels. They are basically gonna now start working under TV terms. If they're coming under these budget levels, they are still gonna be working for what we refer under, what we call the new media side letter, where it is free bargaining, okay? Or you know, where you guys freely bargain or your agent freely bargains for you. And we can take questions later on it. I will say for disclaimers, we, I don't work in the new media department, um, but because it's television, we can answer the TV terms. And if you guys later decide you want more specifics about new media, I would bet that the, we have a terrific new media department that they'd be happy to come in and do a new media presentation for you guys. I'm having like issues again with this. Are you guys able to do the slide? Now they told me to point it at the um, thing over there and it doesn't want to turn. There we go, thank you, okay. So terms from TV and the codified basic agreement apply except for tiers two and three, and again a reminder, tiers two is for 15 million and above, but obviously the lower budget rate, and tier three is for um, 
platforms that have less than 15 million subscribers, there is a producer may credit 35% of the minimum for series and term performers. Major role does not exist um, yet, I will say. Um, maybe the next contract negotiation. It does not exist yet in new media. For tiers two and three, travel is its straight time. And just some differences with reuse. Side letter 21 governs all promotional reuse and reuse into new media programs. And section 36 governs other reuses except that consent may be obtained at the time of engagement. Okay, so we're gonna turn it over to Dan. Because for those of us in TV, when we think of CW, we think of Dan Bowser. <laughs> Hello, long time Dawson's Creek watcher myself. <laughs> um, I'm going to take you through the uh, achievements that were um, gained uh, during this uh, last round of negotiations under the um, CW, pertaining to the CW supplement. And the uh, most important uh, increase uh, was the uh, advance payment for residuals, uh, increased from Originally, the advance payment for residuals, if you were making uh, double scale, in anything in excess of double scale, or for a one hour program, uh, the total applicable minimum, minimum, anything in excess of that can be credited against residuals. And here, and I received a call from a lot of performers where, let's say you receive a $10,000 uh, engagement for, uh, to render services for an uh, episode that's under the CW supplement. And uh, the first question that I would uh, you know, hear from these performers, I haven't received a residual. And I said, okay, well, let me take a look at your contract. And then I looked at the terms, and there's language in there which, I, which allocates what, what your initial compensation covers and the amount that is going to cover for residuals. And it's a big shock to a lot of performers where they assume that we're, we're making $10,000. $10,000, that is going to just be purely for your initial comp. But in reality, under the previous agreement, uh, a majority of that amount uh, is going to be for residuals. Uh, this uh, round of bargaining, we were uh, able to achieve a, in a significant increase where uh, you're making nine, th if you, make, you have to make over $9,000 per week in order for any type of crediting to occur. So that puts a lot of money back into uh, the performer's pocket. And therefore, when residuals actually start become doing owing, you don't have to really worry about there um, any take any taking of uh, your initial comp for uh, residuals? It's not going to be credited as long as you're making um, less than nine thousand uh, dollars. Also, if this is ever for a rerun on network prime time, uh, that amount is going to be eight thousand dollars for a half hour show and one hour for uh, an hour long um, show. And also, there's uh, no advance payments for uh, day performers as well. Uh, next, uh, meal periods. Uh, meal periods for series regulars and backgrounds are per the TV agreement. Now, part, one thing about the CW a supplement, it's a combination of terms under the uh, SAC TV agreement and also the uh, network code agreement. It's a, it's a hodgepodge, basically, of various uh, provisions. And one of the uh, provisions um, in regards to meal periods, that was previously under the uh, network code for regarding series, series regulars and background performers. And one thing, the difference between meal periods for uh, under the network code and the uh, TV agreement, under the SAG television agreement, meal penalties is co it's a it's continuous a continuous run. So let's say, for instance, uh, for meal periods, whenever you start work, your a meal break is due six hours from the time you start work. So you start work at uh, eight o'clock. Your next meal break is uh, two o'clock. If uh, they break past 2 o'clock, that's when the clock begins to uh, roll in regards to penalties under the SAC TV agreement, whereas under the uh, our net code agreement, you're just going to be paid one penalty violation for that, for that um, one miss, if you're over that amount for uh, meal penalties, I mean meal breaks. So if they run over the 2 o'clock uh, meal break time, you're just going to be paid one penalty amount, whereas under the TV agreement, let's say the, uh, you don't break for a meal until 4 o'clock. For meal penalties under the TV agreement, the first half hour is $25. So let's say from 2 o'clock to 2.30 where they didn't break you for 
a uh, meal that's $25 that's going to be due to the performer, okay, now from 2.30 to 3 o'clock, and they, you're still working, that's $35 because that's a second meal penalty. And from the third meal penalty, if they didn't break you into 3 o'clock until 3.30, that's a third meal penalty under the TV agreement, that is $50. And that $50 would be the continuous, it will continue to be accrued for $50 as long as they do not break you. So from 3.30 to 4, that's due another $50. So when you look at the math, in that two-hour period, you earned $160. Compared to uh, under the previous agreement, if you were a serious performer, it just would have been um, just one amount, I think around $27, I'm not sure. So that's a, a great achievement. And it gives a, an incentive for producers to uh, really break you for meals. Uh, and also uh, another achievement uh, pertaining to background performers. Uh, well, it's not really achievement. It's just a, uh, there's a different, there's a change. I'm sorry, there's a change in which uh, the caps were lowered from uh, 50 to uh, 45 in the New York area and 40 to 35 in all other areas. But one good thing about our achievement under the uh, CW supplement, we were able to increase uh, background pay by uh, 5%. And is there anything else regarding CW? No, thank you. Okay. 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 Um, so, with respect to background actors, uh, effective in the second year, uh, two stand ins were removed from the Schedule X one count for TV and one for theatrical. Um, Producers are no longer obligated to pay consecutive employment to a background actor upgraded on a set who is subsequently employed in the same role. And uh, lastly, the high budget SVOD terms increase the numbers of covered background from 10 to 21 in X1 zones and 10 to 25 in the X2 zones. Oh yeah, okay, money breaks. And, and, and you know, in regards to, uh, uh, are people familiar with the uh, X1 and X2 zones? Yeah. Okay, well, X, X1 zones, it really, per, it really pertains to uh, the West Coast. Uh, X2 is really pertains to uh, New York, essentially. All right, uh, well, we'll we go to money break next. Uh, money breaks, uh, in regards to um, fittings, wardrobe tests, and and, uh, and makeup tests, uh, it, it was increased from 1,000 to 1,200. But I believe this increase won't be effective until July 1st, 2015. And this increase was necessary because the, the scale rate right now for, uh, let's say under an Exhibit A show is $911. And let's say you have an agent that's 10%. So when you factor in the 10% with the 911, that's above the $1,000. So essentially, you got a free fitting. That's why we wanted to really achieve an increase in order for uh, performers who are fitted on the day prior to work. You're, you're going to be compensated rather than just uh, have a free fitting. Um, this is really for uh, pertains to uh, day performers. Uh, this $1,000, uh, the increase from 1,000 to 1,200. Uh, next, uh, the premiums for six and seven days. Uh, this pertains to if you are the sixth or seventh day you actually worked, consecutive day you worked. And this really pertains more to uh, weekly performers. Uh, day performers, you're, you're not really going to have uh, six or seven day work. Uh, most producers, if you're going to hire a day performer for, you know, if you're working more than three days, you're probably going to put them on a the weekly contract just to save money. It's more cost effective to, uh, put them under a weekly rather than just run a, a continuous day performer contract for six days. Um, so in regards to weekly performers, if you work on the sixth or seventh day, um, in addition to being paid for that day of work, it's a premium pay that's going to be due, uh, which is $475. And that number comes from really, uh, it's either your day of pay or 470, half, half of your day of pay, or your pro rata, or $475, whichever is the lesser amount. Uh, so some people may achieve less than the $475, but if you're making significantly more, uh, it's gonna cap out the $475. Um, sa same for uh, the seventh day where you receive an actual full day of pay, 
And again, it's 900, previously it was $950 or uh, your pro rata day of pay. Uh, the achievements that we were uh, able to accomplish uh, this, during this round of negotiations, it increased from $950 to $1,000. And also uh, in regards to uh, the 1425 to 1500, that's uh, really pertains to if you actually work. Uh, let's see, so seven, combination six. of the sixth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you actually work the sixth and seventh day, my math is you know not that great. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, again, money breaks this. Money breaks for uh, exercise of subsequent seasons and options. This uh, really relates to people who are under a series deal, deal performers, series regulars, which you know, we, we call them. Uh, previously, uh, the, in order for an ex option to uh, be exercised or actually for a performer to be under an option, you have to make a certain amount, and that amount previously was uh, 8,500 in order to uh, tie a performer for a, a subsequent season. Uh, we increased that to uh, nine. That was a, we increased that to nine thousand know, dollars for for this round of um, bargaining. Uh, and again, the uh, we mentioned the va advance payments as I uh, mentioned earlier. It, it was increased from eight thousand to nine thousand per week. Um, and that's one of the uh, other achievements we, uh, we we were able to accomplish regarding the uh, money breaks. All right, schedule breaks. Uh, they want to do schedule breaks, Lon? Sure, I'll do schedule breaks. Schedule breaks. The schedules, briefly, Schedule A is a day player. Schedule B is a freelance performer or weekly player. Schedule C, oh my my, I'm sorry. Schedule A is a day player. Schedule B is a weekly player. Schedule C is a weekly player who is making money over the money break. So that that would be these are these are TV numbers. Forty eight is going from forty eight hundred per week in the second year of the contract, meaning this coming July, to five thousand per week in theatrical motion pictures. It is currently sixty two hundred dollars a week for for the basic agreement. But the schedules D and E also weekly rates, but for that they're never used D and E. That's back from studio days, where you were under contract with a studio for multiple pictures. We don't see those used. G is singers. Uh, H is stunt performers. I is, pi is pilots. J is dancers. So those breaks are going from 6,000 to 6,200 per week for the theatrical contract, and from 4,650 per week to 5,000 per week for television. Uh, what happens at those breaks under Schedule C, because the producer is paying you that much money, uh, there's no weekly overtime on Schedule C. There's also, if you begin your, your engagement on an overnight location, the travel day to that location <clears throat> doesn't have to be compensated. So they could fly you from here to Wyoming to do a shoot, and your, your salary wouldn't start, your work week wouldn't begin until the following day. That's Schedule C and how that goes. And that's schedule breaks. Thank you, Juan. You're welcome. OK, a couple other, um, you know, a lot of the changes were on TV. But let's see, for uh, day performers um, on all motion pictures, but not uh, half hour multi-camera television, rehearsal does not start consecutive employment under certain conditions. So um, basically, this was sort of used to extend uh, that, something that's already in the contract to episodic television. The second one, which was actually fairly controversial, we spent a lot of time talking about it, was um, what's called the shift in the work week. Um, under the contract currently, a producer can pretty much shift uh, a work week once in a th on a theatrical motion picture, and I think once on television yes. um, during a hiatus period. Now the producer may shift the work week without incurring additional costs, provided performers receive at least two consecutive days off. If a shift results, though, in more than four days off for a performer, the producer has to begin consecutive employment on the fifth day. 
Okay, so we have just a couple of additional producer proposals. The New York Studio Zone for principal performers was expanded from 25 to 35 miles for the New like I said, for the New York Studio Zone. Um, there was a side letter that was drafted which would uh, reference courtesy transportation issues because New York has some very specific issues with regard to working nights and being able to get home uh, when you're within that studio zone. And there was also a waiver granted of the, what's called the New York Earned Sick Time Act and similar ordinances in San Francisco, Newark, and Seattle. Okay, these uh, last uh, provisions actually uh, affect, uh, aren't really going to necessarily affect you guys too closely, at least not the first ones, but we were just, we were just, there was some discussion concerning merger of the cooperative funds, the IACF for SAG, the AICF for AFTRA. Um, also, uh, there were, I guess, ch uh, changes to protected group um, terminology. Essentially, that would cover what is listed on, for instance, casting data reports. So we went from a designation of uh, Latino, I mean, I'm sorry, of Hispanic to uh, Hispanic slash Latino. Uh, from uh, black to black slash African American, those kinds of changes. Um, there's a program called the Tri Guild Audit Program, and essentially that is uh, a program that is utilized between three guilds, uh, so the WGA, the DGA, and SAG AFTRA. And what it essentially is for, so it's sort of uh, funded by the producers and what it deals with is auditing uh, for, for purposes of residuals uh, in order to see uh, whether producers are actually complying. Uh, there were some additions, uh, additional arbitrators added uh, on the list of arbitrators. Certain and we removed some dead arbitrators too. Remember that. L literally, literally. <laughs> that was a non controversial proposal, yeah. thankfully. Yeah, actually, that one they accepted pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> we renewed a few expiring clauses. And uh, the last thing I think uh, Beth can cover is, uh, the, I guess, a little bit of the issues that came up with test options on television. Yeah, they're, they're just briefly, because we could, again, we could spend like an hour on, on test options. But for those of you who go up regularly for television and start testing in upcoming pilot seasons, um, what came to our attention through discussions with performers and through performers agents was this concept of a, what, we, what, what became known as this floating test option date where, I don't know how many of you remember, but in the old days when you'd go in to test for the network, you'd be doing it live. And now, thanks to technology, people are going in and testing for the network, but they're actually putting you on tape or recording it and sending off the file to the network. And what's happening in certain cases is the data is becoming very amorphous as far as when it gets seen by the network. And so people were concerned that they were being held off, um, being held out for longer periods of time during pilot season. And so they were concerned that they were missing certain opportunities. And so this whole test option issue came to light and we spent a lot of time during negotiations. And one of the things we were able to achieve were meetings with the various creative teams at the networks and their business affairs and legal folks. And so we have recently had a series of meetings with all the different networks to sort of make some good faith um, have some good faith discussions with these people about how to um, just speed up this whole process for when you guys go out and test and just the real life issues that actors are facing when they're going up for testing and what happens in the cases of not being able to get an answer quickly from the network, whether it's yours or not. And I think I can just report that the meetings were very positive and um, the networks definitely seem to understand the issue and commit to working as fast as possible to get answers back to actors so that if they weren't going to be held and hired for this pilot, that they would do their best to get an answer to your agent or rep sooner later rather than later so that you guys could go out for the next opportunity. So that was sort of what you see on the PowerPoint as the test option initiative. And actually, that was a per perfect example, actually, of where the members are so 
integral in being able to tell us what issues are affecting the contract. I mean, if you saw how big the TV theatrical book is, I have a bunch of business reps here, and they'll tell you how big it is. And um, right it's a, there you go. It's, it's just um, that's just one. That's just one. There's a few others. Two. But I mean, the contract is a living contract, and we don't learn anything about how it's working, how it's not working, without your uh, input. And that was a, such, just hearing from some of the working actors was such an amazing uh, experience for us as staff because we really did get to understand what issues are currently affecting. I mean, the, this industry has changed in ways that I don't think people ever envisioned. And uh, having a step up to try to implement changes. I mean, SAG-AFTRA is a big, big organization, and sometimes it's really hard for us to move with the times, but we're learning. It's the, our favorite time. It's the interactive part. It's questions. <laughs> oh, right, okay. All right, so let me put this down. I hope you all used your best handwriting. Somewhere are my glasses, and I don't know where they go. Right there. Oh, Here you go. okay, yep. thank you guys. I feel like my mother now, sorry. <laughs> I used to make fun of my mother when she do this. Okay, all right, so um, is it appropriate, do I read the person's name or no? Okay, Jeff Hall online. Hi Jeff, good evening, thanks for being with us. Is there a place online where the different contract sections referring to background actors are posted? It would be helpful to see the different rules that apply to each type of contract so we can help enforce our rights. Great question, Jeff, thank you. Um, to my knowledge, on the website, and um, I can double check this for you, and you can reach out to me, Beth Millman, at television tomorrow, if that helps you. There is a section for each department, TV, theatrical, commercials, and to my knowledge, and guys, jump in if I'm wrong, where they do delineate the different contracts, and I believe specialty performers, Jeff, where background would come under, I believe that section is listed also. I believe online on the sagafter.org website, there is a, um, sp there's a specific section dedicated to the different background performer contract provisions that affect you. So I wanna say yes, but if you want to reach out to me tomorrow in the television department, I will double check for you and get you to the right people and the right sections if I'm completely off my rocker, which could be at this hour, but I'm pretty sure there is, there is a section on, online for this. Okay, so that's the first question. Okay. Next question, also, um, also online, is from Jeff Holman. Good evening, Jeff. Um, from what I understand, the new terms in the SAG after contracts are based on SAG contracts more than the after contracts. Is this correct? In other words, are the pay rates and residual rates of the new SAG slash after TV contracts closer to the old SAG contracts or to the old after contracts? Well, that's an excellent question and we get a lot of that. So let me try to answer it in the best way possible. Basically, in TV, um, there's, there's this misnomer about AFTRA. There's what we call Exhibit A, and then there's the SAG-TV agreement. And so Exhibit A, and this is for, think about it in terms of dramatic programming, shows like The Good Wife, shows like Revenge, okay? Those shows, those terms, whether it be SAG or AFTRA, are identical whether it's Exhibit A or whether it's the television agreement. The only difference under after Exhibit A is there was no preference of employment under Exhibit A, right, Dan? And that's what true, was the yeah. one other? Was there one other difference, or that's that's, 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 the, that's the basically main difference, preference that's of basically it. So as far as prime time, sort of dramatic, Jeff, you're gonna find it. You know, they're they're pretty similar. Um, you may be thinking there might be some differences in cable. And I think what you'll find with this new agreement is that going forward, the terms are going to be identical and they're going to look a lot like SAG TV and after Exhibit A, which were, which were similar. Um, if you're thinking in terms of cable, there were some, you know, 
Maybe there were some deals you were thinking of specifically. Certain cable networks have some very specific deals, which happened because it was at a time when um, work was being organized. And in order to get work organized, there, was, there were different deals that were cut. But I think as far as um, the pay rates and residuals, I think the residuals, as far as prime time dramatic, they're going to be what you're used to seeing under what you'd consider SAG TV, but that's basically exhibit A residuals were the same as SAG TV. And if you have specific questions about that, Jeff, our residuals department is pretty fantastic and they could probably walk you through a lot more eloquently than I can the residuals portion. Um, do you think there's anything I'm missing, guys, for this question? No, you cover, uh, no. You cover basically okay. a little bit. Okay. Anybody in the room have any questions? Oh. oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is from Jason Forcaro. The question, what will the future look like after DVD and Blu-ray go away? How will SAG after plan and or amount for this future change? Well, in, reg in regards for, um, you know, regard DVDs or uh, Blu-ray going away, you know, for, that's, um, that's really more of a, for the initial comp, you're, you're, whether it's uh, DVD or whether it's uh, you know network TV, you're going to be paid the same amount. The only difference you're dealing with is uh, more of a residual structure. But the residuals are a little different uh, from a network prime time or basic cable or uh, DVDs and, and Blu-ray. And and to be honest, I would probably defer that to our residuals department to give you more details as to the uh, differences between the uh, residual payments and obligations for a, pro, uh, a project that's produced for a direct DVD and as comparison to uh, network prime time or a basic cable as well. Um, actually, I'll take a stab at that, although um, I'm not gonna get too much into detail about residuals because I might get in trouble. Um, what I will say is definitely um, the disappearance of DVD and Blu-ray is definitely something at the forefront of at least with in theatrical and TV as well. I mean, we know that's coming. All that really means is that um, for, the, for the contract provisions themselves, it just means that maybe the way that residuals are calculated for the future, you're gonna basically be looking at other forms of media for purposes of monetizing what the residuals are gonna look like is all. It's just you're changing, we're gonna be changing our um, mode of calculation. You know, just that's where a lot, uh, we're going to look at where things are being currently exploited. Yeah, Jason had a second question, which uh, Dan and I are puzzling about. It's, uh, can you elaborate on, quote, producers do not have to pay background actors for consecutive employment. How does that differ, differ from pre the previous agreement? And... Uh, this is uh, on an upgrade. Yeah. This is when a yeah. background performer is upgraded to a principal performer and then subsequently used in the production in that same upgraded role. You want me to take it? Yeah, because okay. what happened? Okay, well, <laughs> I and don't again, know. I, I'll do my disclaimer. I don't work for specialty performers. So, Jason, um, you may want to tomorrow follow up with the specialty performer department, but I'm going to take a stab. I used to be a field rep in my younger days, um, so I spent a bit of time with Schedule X and Schedule X2, um, but mostly Schedule X1, I think, because uh, mm -hmm. I was in LA. But um, previous, Jason, what would happen is, is if you worked as a background performer and were given a line and got upgraded, you obviously became, a, let's say, a day performer. And what we heard from the background community is, it was almost an unwillingness in some cases to give you that upgrade because they were concerned about getting hit with consecutive employment, about giving you the upgrade, having you work, and then they'd want to bring you back in like a few days and they didn't have the budget to pay the consecutive employment. And so it almost worked against the background performer getting that opportunity to get a line and get those great residual, get a residual check. And um, so what happened, and this wasn't something that just sort of we gave as a concession. This was something, if I recall, from our wages and working conditions that was brought up that they there was a you know within certain fo certain folks within the background community 
wanted us to make a change similar to this, if I'm recalling, and I hope I'm not remembering incorrectly, but I'm pretty sure I'm remembering correctly that if we, there was a feeling that if we got rid of that consecutive employment for the background performer, they would have more opportunities for the upgrades because it wouldn't work as a barrier, the consecutive employment, and that if they got the upgrade and got that principal role, that then the producer wouldn't have to worry if they came back in the same character and they'd have more opportunity to work. So that's why we did this um, and agreed to get rid of that consecutive employment. And that's, that's really interesting, Beth. And, and I th if well, that's my I, recollection. No, that makes absolute sense. Yeah. And, and many of you will be more familiar with a similar issue as commercial performers. Mm -hmm. You'll know that if you're called back for a third audition, there's pay for that on an hourly rate. There's not pay for the third, fourth, fifth, or umpteenth callback on an audition for theatrical performers. And this was a provision that had been put across the board or had come to us several contracts ago. But ultimately, the performers said, you know, no, we want every shot we can get for that principal role in a theatrical piece. We understand that in commercials, there's so many, you're grinding through auditions constantly. We need to have something for the third call. But, but for theatrical, there's no pay for auditioning no matter how many times they call you in. And again, this was a performer-driven concession, if you will, that made sense uh, from a performer's perspective. OK. I learned something new now. There you go. Yeah. Take it, Dan. <laughs> uh, the next question is from David. Uh, what is the CW other than the network? Um, the CW, it was tailored for the uh, CW network. Prior to um, the CW network, I believe it was the UPN WB network. And uh, this agreement was called the UPNWB agreement. And basically, when, whenever there's a new network, uh, the, the network or producers from, people who are producing content for this network, uh, they, they would reach out to the union to uh, help us, to help them be successful. And by that, we're, there are certain carved out uh, agreements uh, that were not, would not really be uh, fully incorporated to the TV terms and conditions. Uh, the SAC TV agreement, as I mentioned earlier, where it's uh, a mixture of uh, AFTRA net code uh, terms as well as uh, the SAC TV terms. Uh, in, my, in the previous presentation, we discussed the uh, mill penalties, how under the CW agreement prior to uh, this uh, negotiations, uh, mill penalties were under the uh, network code where uh, it's not continuous. Uh, you know, these achievements were, uh, we, we achieved a continuous mill penalties under a TV agreement for this uh, go around. But for CW Network, it, it's really, all the shows that's produced on the CW usually are under the CW agreement. But also this uh, really, this agreement was allowed for a certain cable series as well prior to uh, our merge with uh, Legacy AFTRA. When it was like when it was AFTRA, we was two separate organizations. It was AFTRA and Screen Actors Guild. Um, there were some cable shows which uh, CW terms and conditions were allowed based on certain based on their budget. Uh, they were at a lower budget. Certain concessions uh, were made in order for them to grow and be successful. Uh, but there are still certain still shows that are grandfathered in where. They are still under the CW terms and conditions. Uh, they were in existence prior to uh, prior to the new uh, new agreement. Where I believe I don't think we're still using uh, CW terms and conditions moving forward. Everything's under the uh, SAG TV agreement. Uh, SAG it's a SAG after TV agreement for any new shows. But there are still uh, shows that are in ex were in existence prior to uh, this new agreement. They were grandfathered in, so all the terms from grandfather in too. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? I want to give this to you. Oh, um, uh, Should we get the mic? When I, um, just repeat her question. Oh, in, 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 the, in the last uh, year or so of uh, doing day photo rolls on soap operas, um, I went online and there's no provisions, there's no nothing on provisions for day photo rolls for soap operas. Okay. There's, so, so then I called SAG, and I I was able to find the reps for Golden Beautiful or okay. Hospital, mm -hmm. 
And so I called that rep. And so basically the process to find out how much, oh, thanks. Um, a day player role, um, what you make for a day player role, you have to actually call the particular rep for that soap opera and only he or she can tell you exactly how much you make for a day player role. Like if I'm working on Bold and Beautiful, I, I can't call the GH rep to actually tell me how much I am to be paid. They make sure that you have to call that particular rep for that soap. So you, that's your process of communication. And I was wondering if there's now, I, I don't know if it is because I haven't checked, you know, if there are any provisions online yeah, I so think that we so. can safeguard okay. ourselves. I don't know why okay. my question was in there somewhere, but no, it's a you, good question. Does that make I sense? think Am what I, she was talking about previous, previous to merger or just last year, are you talking about? Um, okay. No, uh, just last year. Okay. I think what she was saying, one of our members, was last year there was nothing online with regard to the network code, and the network code is the agreement that would cover daytime serials, shows like Bold and Beautiful, Days of Our Lives. So to my knowledge, that should change. We just negotiated um, new terms. We just had a negotiation for the network code, and I believe that will go up just like every other agreement. So I don't think you will have to specifically get to the name of the rep. Um, as far as I know, that should be up on our website along with um, every other contract. And for some reason, I thought the net code was already up on the website. So Dan's saying it actually is up. So you could yeah. probably go to our website now and actually find your rate online. That's why I'm a little confused only because when I checked, it was up. So I don't know if maybe, the, it, it is a little bit tricky sometimes. I know with TV, because we have so many agreements, it can be a little bit tricky finding out clicking TV and then agreements and then knowing which one, but I'm pretty sure that it is up and I'm positive it will be going up. Okay. So, awesome. yeah. And when the rep told me how much I was due, obviously I had that information when I went in, so when I was ready to sign the day player contract, it had the wrong amount. Oh, so you yeah. are so I, dangerous, you knew. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I was like, oh. <laughs> That's She's like, that, what doesn't, that isn't what the me. rep said. That's yeah. a little too low. So then yeah. they actually had a yeah. call. I love it. Yeah. SAG yeah. or yeah. AFTRA. And, Education. You know, right. The best, it isn't it, to you guys? I, I was like, mm, this is a lower rate. There's That's nothing not better than saying, no, I'm sorry. I'm actually owed more money than that. Yeah. And that you would know that. That's great. Yeah. So I think you will find, and I can show you if, you, if we have like a computer here, I can show you after, like where online it is. Yeah, of course. She's going to show me too. I'm going to show Olga. She never uh, checks our website. <laughs> hey, um, I, uh, you ha used a few technical terms like consecutive employment. Can you explain us to a few, of, you know, person like me who yeah. doesn't understand what it means? Yeah, like, you know something? These two are, like, the best at, like, I will go into, like, legalese to the Costco home. So, I'll let, like, Dan Alon can, like, bullet point for you, like, simple. Go ahead, guys. Yeah. Okay, okay I'll, I'll start. That's a couple of different rules depending on the classification of a performer. Uh, if you're a day performer, there's different rules and it's for, for us weekly performer. Uh, day performer, basically, uh, let's say you start on uh, Monday and, and they want to bring you back Tuesday, I mean bring you back Wednesday. That day, intervening day, which is Tuesday, the day you don't work, uh, for consecutive employment rules, you're going to be paid for that day because that is an intervening day between the two days you work. You work Monday, you work Wednesday, and that Tuesday, you're going to receive compensation for that. Uh, there are a few exceptions uh, for consecutive employment for a day performer. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, you probably heard of like drop and pick up. Or you haven't? Okay, I'll explain it. Uh, drop and pick up basically is a rule, it's an exception to consecutive employment for day performers, meaning that if um, 14 intervening days pass from the time the performer, day performer worked, and they're given the firm start date, then you don't have to pay for all that intervening time. So let's say you start on Monday again, and then 14 days from that time, the producer wants to you to come back to render service. 
rather than ex having the expectation of having all of that intervening time uh, subject to some type of compensation, it's an exception where you're only going to be paid for that Monday and then the day, the 14 days after your, uh, the work for after the 14 days. Does it make sense? Is that for film or is it also for multiple what? episodes? Because if there, if you are, so one is the film contract, which is a 30 yes. day shoot or 40 day shoot. Mm -hmm. And so you're coming back after 14 days. Mm -hmm. But then, um, like, I was upgraded on a TV show, and then they called me back about 17, 18 days later for a second episode. And then another 10 days later, they wanted me to come back for the background role again. Yeah. But I couldn't do that one uh, that day. So how does that work? Because it's different episodes. Yes. Yeah. And one thing about consecutive employment, it only applies to the actual episode, picture, picture you, you worked for. So if you worked on a different picture, and you're being brought back. You're not going to be so. That's not going to be subject to consecutive employment. It only pertains to the picture, whether it's an episodic uh, television or uh, also theatrical film. And you, you want to go over a weekly um, consecutive employment because the rules are totally different for a weekly consecutive employment. Yes, I do. Take it away. <laughs> and and the uh, on theatrical sec if it's a domestic shoot, it's a 10-day calendar day that is required. The drop if there's a drop and a pickup on daily. You cannot drop and pick up a weekly performer on a standard contract. It's consecutive employment from the day you start until the day you wrap, with the exception of the low budget contracts. And one of the big breaks for a producer on low budget contracts is a waiver of consecutive employment, which they can get from the performer. It's on, if they use our contracts, which we like them to do just because otherwise they make mistakes. But if they use our contracts, it's the first thing after the principal information at the top of the form, the picture, your name, your, your rate, your starting date. Then there's a box to check to saying you agree to waive consecutive employment. And this allows them to schedule you much more freely. On a weekly performer who waives consecutive employment on a low budget picture, you're still employed in weekly increments. So they'll, they need to pay you for the five days you work in those first seven days. And they're two days off in a studio zone or one day off on an overnight location. Then they can drop you and pick you up later. And again, they have to pay you a full week until your final week of work. And then they can prorate the, the, the week. But generally, we think of consecutive employment for weekly performers to be the first day you're hired all the way until you wrap, and, uh, and except with the exception of the low budget contracts. Can I just add something? It might help you guys to think about consecutive employment this way. And I'm going to talk about it from a television term, you know, from TV thinking and for the day player. Think about it this way. You, as a day player, you know, you're trying to pick up work and you're trying to, you know, keep paying the bills. And the reason you, we say after the 14 days, if there's those you know, intervening days and that you only would have to pay the first day and then when they bring you back is, if you're working on an episode Monday and then Wednesday, it's gonna be very hard for you to pick up something in between on that Tuesday. That's why we make, you know, we, you, you have to be paid. However, for like, you know, the 14 days pass, you're most likely to, to be able to get another gig and do something during that time. And right. so it's that there's do you know no that's absolutely yeah, that's, that's absolutely sometimes why it helps that when you think about the practicality but of it to understand the, another it. thing to remember on the yeah. weekly performers on yeah. the low budget contracts yeah. there's no requirement for a yeah. ten day drop yeah so it can be just a one or two day drop on a low budget deal and there the flip side of that coin is that because you've accepted employment on a low budget the producer if has to allow you to find other work during those breaks. And if something comes up, he has to make his best effort to work around your new schedule with your conflicting production. And that can be some of the toughest times we have, <laughs> working with two producers and one performer who wants to do both gigs and uh, trying to help have that worked out. So, uh, but it doesn't come up as often as you might think. Okay, okay. This is from Michelle, and she asked, "What are the main differences between the new additions for subscription VOD and NPT, which I'm guessing is Network Prime Time, 
And can you give a brief example of how a residual works with mediums like Netflix, Amazon, and Prime? And unfortunately, we're not the residual department, so I'm almost afraid to give you um, an answer as far as that. But I can tell you, um, when you work for Netflix, you do a project made for Netflix, it is a very different residual structure that your initial comp covers a much longer period of time um, than what you're used to in working under network prime time. And so unfortunately, since I don't have the residual breakdown in front of me, and I'm, I think I could give you an answer, but since this is gonna be like saved for posterity, <laughs> I'm gonna get yelled at by the residual department if I give it wrongly. So just for, to preserve my own like not wanting to be yelled at tomorrow when I go into the office, I would ask um, if, you, I, I, if you're okay with it, Michelle, if you reach out to me tomorrow in the television department, I can pull my little cheat sheet and give it to you. But I, I wanna say, we'll see if I'll go out on a limb. I wanna say like your initial comp covers you when you work on a made for Netflix for the first year. And then I wanna say it's like 30% after for like, or is it like 26 weeks? Am I like losing my mind here? Who can jump in and see if I'm... I lost my mind. All right, no, see there, I lost my mind. All right, so like ixnay everything I just said, guys, you know, and give me a cocktail right about now. But <laughs> um, so if Michelle, if you, if you get back to me tomorrow and see like Jennifer Godry, who's the national director of residuals, is like, Milman, you're killing me here. What are you saying? But I'll get you an answer. Like I'll, I want you guys to have answers since this obviously was an important question. So reach out to me in TV, Beth Milman, and um, I'll, I'll get you an answer. So we'll, we'll get you taken care of. How does the contract change based on location? Like there are a lot of shows being shot in North Carolina, some shows being shot in um, Canada. Are, are they covered under SAG after contracts or not? Yes, yes, yes. And I are, mean, there's obviously travel provisions. So as far as depending on where you're shooting and depending on who the company is and um, how they're sort of interpreting different sections, but there are, they are covered under sag aftra yes. Okay, well, just really quickly yeah, on, and the, then on the Canada side of it, though. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, I was just uh, oh, I was focusing about. more about North Carolina, and then oh, you want to take Canada? Well, I was, yeah. just, just going to say that uh, the sag aftra for a sag aftra performer, the contract is a contract is a contract, regardless of really where you're working. If you're in Canada, you are working under those SAG terms. Uh, we do have a reciprocity arrangement with ACTRA and UBCP, where if you go work in Canada, hopefully that project that you're working on is covered by that union. Um, and then our agreement is it becomes like a rider to the ACTRA contract. And so you would still get and benefit from the SAG-AFTRA terms, but they'd be in conjunction with ACTRA sort of uh, enforcing portions of our agreement while you're working in that country. Hi guys, Hi. I have a question. Um, do you have, since there's so much work outside of state, you know, different states besides New York and LA, what's the deal with uh, field reps coming to set? Because I've never seen one out of state okay. coming to visit anybody. Okay. Awesome question. I have an answer. <laughs> okay, so I will tell you that we do have local offices across the country. They are um, staffed, obviously, with less staff than Los Angeles and New York. So first and foremost, if you ever are on a show and working in, say, the New Orleans area and want a rep to come out, you can always, without, you know, nobody's name will get used, you can always reach out to that local office and request a visit. And I guarantee they will get somebody down there as soon as they can. Number two, we have hired somebody who now is a national field rep whose whole job is to start covering and traveling all over the country and visiting shows um, in the different areas because we know there is a need in many regions and I'm sure particularly Sean is thinking of New Orleans, probably New Mexico, probably, you know, other cities. So know that we are aware and we do have someone now working on a national basis whose whole job is to travel and do that. So um, you can always reach out to the local office first and say we'd love to see somebody come down. And then second of all, you can always reach out to 
the LA or New York office and we can get a message to that field rep to go because I believe she's covering TV, theatrical, commercials, etc. And of course the goal will be as resources allowed to get more field reps because I think everybody on this stage knows the value of the field reps and you're talking to someone who's a field rep for seven years, many years ago. So um, it's, you know, I think everything to this union to have enforcement out there and to have the knowledge of what's going on day to day on our set. So I can tell you that this union is very committed to, to getting you reps out on the sets. So great you question. Know, just remember too, education is really important. You guys should learn your contracts. I'm, I always am very impressed by uh, the stunt folks and how well they know their contracts. They really do. I mean, and we rely on you for information on what's happening out there. Uh, call your union if you have concerns, you know, um, because that uh, that's the only way we're able to ask a rep to visit a specific set. I mean, her, it's, she's only one person. And uh, it basically in the areas that are being filmed, I mean, I don't know how she prioritizes where she goes, but if you have issues on a project that you're working on that is not in LA or New York, um, the best thing to do is, like Beth said, call the office and try to get, see if we can get um, someone to visit the set that you're concerned about. And it can be anonymous, however you want to yeah. handle it. Uh, they're supposed to give our reps access, um, but we need you guys to be active participants in pro protecting not only yourself, but other, others, um, other performers, your brothers and sisters in the union. Yeah, and we never say, Steve Sims called and said, you need a rep down. So we just, you know, believe me. We're not, we're not you know. So you are allowed to keep your confidentiality. And I think that's, I think we're, Thank you know. Thank you very much. I think um, that's it, guys. Thank you so much for letting us have this opportunity. Thank you.